Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, The Gospel of Mark, Dr. McLuhan shares how Mark introduced younger Greeks and Romans to the life of Jesus. The Apostle Peter saw something in Mark that neither Barnabas nor Paul saw. Barnabas and Paul saw him as a helper, but Peter saw him as an author. Peter saw in John Mark a person capable of introducing the next generation of younger Gentiles to the life of Jesus. Mark himself was the youngest gospel writer. Mark was born into a blended family. His mother was Jewish and his father was a Roman from the Cyrene city of Cyrene, a prosperous Roman colony in the country of Libya. To learn more about Mark, we invite you to visit my YouTube channel and watch Meet Mark, Dr. Peter McLuhan, and learn more about the author himself. Uh, no doubt that Mark could read and write Greek, Latin, and Aramaic, a scholar in his own right, at least a linguist in his own right, and Mark translated important Aramaic or Hebrew words Jesus used into Greek to make sure the Gentile readers got the meaning of what Jesus was trying to say. Mark worked closely with the Apostle Peter, recording the memories and eyewitness reports of the things that Jesus said and did. Mark's research helped both Matthew and Luke write their account of the life of Jesus. Even though the Gospel of Matthew comes first, Mark was the first Gospel to have been written, and there's no doubt the others had access to what he wrote. They would review his writing and then add their own thoughts. So scholars refer to the writings of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels. I don't know if that's a term that you've heard they are called synoptic because they can be seen together. So sometimes the stories are identical in the Gospels, and at other times stories are portrayed through a wider lens with additional information. If one writer says there were two people and another says there was one, it just means the writer focused in on that one and the other focused in on the larger group. These differences are complementary and add richness to the stories. Uh, each of these authors contributed their own unique material to the Gospels as the Spirit of God inspired them to write without error. Mark divided his Gospel into three parts. The first part focuses on Jesus in Galilee, and the third part focuses on Jesus in Jerusalem. In between, in the second part, are the various travels that Jesus made in and out of Galilee, some to the north and some to the south. So it's the encounters that Jesus had between Galilee and Jerusalem as he faced the closing moments of his life. Part one covers chapters one through eight. Uh, Mark skips the genealogy of Jesus that would not mean much to younger non-Jewish writers or readers. He begins with a powerful, provocative attention getter about who Jesus is. Imagine just out out reading this. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, as provocative as that sounds to you or to me, that would not be so provocative to a Greek or Roman audience. Greek and Romans were familiar with the idea of the gods coming down to earth. However, when Greek or Roman gods came down, bad things happened to people. In contrast, when Jesus came down to earth, he brought good news and good things happened to people that he touched. As you read Mark, you'll notice the word immediately. It's got to grab your attention. You see it over and over and over. It's one of Mark's favorite words. So to appeal to a younger audience, Mark delivered his content briefly and in rapid succession. Does that sound like the next generation always moving on quickly to the next thing? So initially, people were astounded by the things that Jesus said and did. Many were healed. Many were set free from demons. 
we find people asking, who is this one? Who is Jesus? Who is this person that can do these things? And after introducing Jesus as the Son of God, Mark quotes from the prophets Isaiah and Malachi, who points to Jesus as Messiah. Now, there's another key word. That uh, Greek phrase for Messiah is the anointed one. So that's what Greeks understand, the anointed one from God. So this is how we read it. It is written in the Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I'm sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in a wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah 30, Malachi 3, Mark chapters 1, verses 1, 2 through 3. So Mark identified John the Baptist as the one who prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus. John simply and clearly announced, I baptize you with water, but Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8. So after Jesus was baptized, a voice was heard from heaven. Mark uses this very clear language. It's like the heavens were torn apart or the heavens ripped open. It wasn't like a wispy thing. There was a clear sound, the sound of a new voice to be heard in the land. And this is what it said. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Mark chapter 1, verse 11. Now, I never understood the importance of this moment in Jesus' life uh, until a prophetess said those words over me. I, I never saw that coming, never anticipated it. And when we know who we are and that we are loved, we can face anything. God knew that Jesus needed to hear those words. God knew the many cruel things that would be said to Jesus. And so Jesus had this moment to hold on to. No matter what people said to him, he knew he had his father's approval. Uh, one day, re God revealed to me, if Jesus needed to hear these words, how much more do you and I need to have these words said over our lives? I'm sure someone listening to this message has never been blessed by his or her father. Worse yet, you may have been cursed by your father every day of your earthly life. And I lift those curses off of you and say to you that your heavenly Father loves you and is proud of you. You don't have to do anything to earn your heavenly Father's approval or his love. He loves you not for what you do, but for who you are. I feel certain that this sentence is for somebody who's been cursed all of their life. The rest of this section in Mark releases the core message that Jesus preached. Mark recorded that Jesus went about Galilee saying, the time promised by God has come at last. Aren't you so glad your time finally comes? The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 from the New Living Translation. Now I hope you noticed the subtle change on how Mark presented the message of Jesus. Mark was written primarily to Gentiles, non-Jews, and so he said the kingdom of God has arrived. Uh, since Matthew wrote primarily to a Jewish audience, he announced that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Gentiles have no problem saying the word God out loud. But even to this day, you'll never hear a Jewish person say, my God or oh God, that would just be a horrible thing for them to say because of their reverence for his name. They'll say the name or Adonai meaning the Lord. And so this is an understanding that Mark knows who he is writing to and how they will respond to that language. So in rapid succession, Mark continues to tell more stories of Jesus touching people, healing them, and setting them free from demons. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. Not in the first century, not ever. Now, one thing that Jesus did in this section was forgive sin. Now, people knew that that was only something that God could do. That riled up the leaders tremendously. It was one of the ways that Jesus demonstrated that he was God in the flesh, 
or God in person. <clears throat> uh, Jesus drew different reactions from people over this incident. Some people accepted him and followed him. Others didn't know what to think, but most of the religious leaders were immediately skeptical that Jesus would claim to have power or authority to forgive sin. He said, my father gave me authority to forgive sin. And so they began to reject Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. Now, many of the stories and parables that Jesus told are in this section of the book of Mark. And it is here that we find the first of two parables that are unique to Mark and not found any of the other writings of the Gospels. The first is the story about a farmer who went to sow seed on two kinds of soil. Now, immediately you're thinking of the man who sowed on four different kinds of soil, but this is a completely different parable. In this case, the first soil represented the Jewish people. And in the second type of soil, Jesus was representing the Gentile nations of the world. The parable makes it clear that Jesus came to seek and to save everyone. This is an important understanding, an important parable to read. Mark uh, was a lights, camera, action kind of guy. Uh, it's another way that we know that Mark was writing to a younger audience or the next generation, the TikTok generation. His gospel is designed to reach that faster-paced audience, a much faster-paced audience than Matthew, Luke, or John. If you're sharing the message of Jesus with someone who is younger, I encourage you to start with the gospel of Mark and have a Bible study with the gospel through the Bible, through the gospel of Mark, and the study will progress quickly. It's only 16 chapters, the shortest of the gospels, and it will not take that long to go through. And people really want to know, can this Jesus change my life? And after he's changed your life, then you can delve into the deeper teachings that are a part of the other gospels. So the middle section of the gospel of Mark is found in chapters 8 through 10. They overlap in chapter 8 halfway through. This section focuses on the encounter Jesus had with people as he moved towards Jerusalem. The first time that Jesus traveled north, uh, traveled first north and then south, was to Caesarea Philippi. And it is in Caesarea Philippi that he asked the question, who do people say that I am? Now, you will remember that we already looked at that in the Gospel of Matthew. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include the story because it is critical to understanding the first mission of Jesus. Now, Peter answered the question, question correctly by saying, you are the son of God. We talked about that can only come by the spirit of God revealing. But even though he gave the right answer, he still didn't have the right understanding of what that meant. Peter is still thinking of Jesus as being a political ruler rather than being a suffering servant. <clears throat> Jesus knew that he could not reign as a king until he had suffered as a servant. And this brings us to the key verse of Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If you were to memorize one verse out of Mark, that would be the verse to memorize. Gets it right to the heart of it that Jesus came as a suffering servant rather than as a reigning king. And he came to ransom people. Uh, somebody wrote to me and said, before I can accept Jesus as my Savior, I need some questions answered. I said, well, you can't be saved because you don't know you need to be saved. You can't accept, <laughs> people wanting to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior have no recognition of needing a Lord and Savior. And so when people try to be uh, uh, pushy that way, I just say, I'm sorry, it's not available for you right now because you're coming from the wrong point of view. Uh, that's not too hard to understand. If you uh, jump out of a boat and are about to drown, you don't ask the person who's throwing you, the, uh, throwing you a lifeline or uh, tell me about your political views, tell me about this, tell me about your doctrine, tell me about... No, no, just give me the rope. I need to be saved. <laughs> and until we come to the point that we realize we need to be saved, then Jesus is ready to save us. So following this teaching... Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up Mount Hermon, 
And Mount Hermon is located directly behind Caesarea, a tremendous amount of rock. Remember, Jesus said, on this rock, I'll build my church. And uh, so as they go up into the heights of Mount Hermon, the highest mountain in the Middle East, in that portion of the world, Jesus is transformed before them. I think that's a word we use too lightly. We, we don't know what the word transform is other than transformers uh, from one thing to another. But Jesus began to shine with the glory of God. Uh, one writer says he shined brighter than any laundry could make him white. <laughs> what an interesting way of wording it and helping people to grasp the shining. And during that moment, we uh, are visited, uh, they are visited by Moses and Elijah. It's such an interesting selection of people. These are the same men who encountered God on Mount Sinai. Both Elijah and Moses saw the glory on the Mount of Sinai. And so while they were there, the same voice that spoke at Jesus' baptism spoke again on Mount Hermon, saying, A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Mark chapter 9 and verse 7. I like to point out to people that it was God himself who identified Jesus as his beloved son, not the apostles, not Mary, uh, not uh, anyone else, not uh, any of the disciples. Uh, it was God himself who said that. It was God himself who said, we must listen to the voice of Jesus. Now, everyone knew that it was God's glory that was seen on Mount Sinai. And by placing this story between all of these events, Mark makes the point that Jesus is God in human form. And the glory on Jesus on Mount Hermon was the same glory that was seen on God on Mount Sinai. And so we invite everyone watching this message to listen for the voice of Jesus and obey him. I'll never forget the first time I heard the audible voice of Jesus speaking to me. I, for a long time, I thought it was me, just for me, but then I understood it's for me to be able to talk about the joy of hearing the voice of God. What he said to me was so important in my understanding of Jesus appearing before people. If you're not sure about who Jesus is, ask him to speak to you. And when you hear his voice, you'll know exactly who it is who was speaking to you. On the way down from this incredible moment, Jesus says to Peter, James, and John rather sternly, tell no one what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Mark chapter 9 and verse 9. Uh, with these words, Jesus is clearly announcing his death, burial, and resurrection. He will be killed, and he will come back to life. He has said it as plainly as it could be said. Have you ever had somebody tell you something, and it just went right by you? And after, some, after it happened, somebody said, remember I told you? And you said, oh, yeah. And that's how this all went down. He told them as plainly as he could. So the last section of Mark is chapters 11 through 16. It opens uh, with Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem with the people saying, save us now. What a great statement. If you're in trouble, just say, save me now, Lord. He drives the many money changers out of the court of Gentiles. This is particularly important for Mark to emphasize because the gospel was written for non-Jewish people to read. Gentiles who wanted to experience the presence of God in the temple could not come any closer to the temple than something referred to as the court of the Gentiles. So Jesus drove the money changers out because it occupied the space that God had intended for non-Jewish people to smell the sounds, to hear, to smell the, the scents going up and the sounds, and to hear the worship. So by placing the money changes there, the religious leaders sent a clear signal to Gentiles that they did not want him to enjoy God's presence. In their view, the temple was their private club. This is exactly why Jesus quoted from the prophet, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Uh, 
Uh, frequently people say to me that Jesus was for the Jews and Muhammad was for everyone else. I can't tell you how many times that's been said to me. These ones uh, understand neither the message of Jesus nor the message of the Quran. The Quran clearly says that Jesus is a sign for all people. So Mark says these events were a turning point for the religious leaders in their attitude towards Jesus. After this, they were so afraid of him that they made their final plans uh, to have him killed. Uh, Jesus, in response, gave his final teaching in which he predicted that within one generation, the temple would be destroyed. Can you imagine those shocking words? He said, not one stone would be left upon another. And so it is that way to this day. His words came true in AD 70 when Titus destroyed the temple and burned the city. At the end of this teaching, Mark records the details of the second parable that is unique to the gospel of Mark. He says, be on guard, Jesus said, be awake, for you do not know when the time will come will be like a man going on a journey when he leaves his home and puts his servants in charge, each one with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Mark, Mark chapter 13, verse 33 through 34. Now, the purpose of this parable is to warn you and me to live in such a way that we will be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. Do you ever play come in ready or not? Jesus is coming, ready or not. Will you be prepared to meet Jesus. Now, the rest of Mark's gospel condenses the Last Supper with Jesus, uh, the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the mock trials before his crucifixion. Now, Mark does take time to note the confession of the Roman centurion who supervised the crucifixion of Jesus. Mark wrote, the centurion who stood facing Jesus is something about face to face. He saw the way he breathed his last. He said, this man was the son of God. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. The centurion was deeply touched with how Jesus died. He understood that Jesus died willingly. He willingly gave up his life for the sins of the people. The centurion, in the end, realized he could not have killed Jesus without Jesus' consent. Jesus himself gave up his life before the centurion pierced his side. I believe we're going to see that centurion in heaven. Wouldn't that be amazing to see him? Um, this particularly important part of Mark's gospel, because he is writing to non-Jewish people, to Romans, urging them to believe in Jesus. And so Mark ends his gospel with Jesus commanding his disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus promised them that his power and presence would go with them. He said these amazing words. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay down their hands. They lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Mark chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. In my travels around the world, I've listened to stories of all of these things happening. People have been bitten by poisonous snakes and didn't die. Family members have given poisonous food to, to relatives, to family members uh, who have uh, turned to Jesus. Some have been shot with poisonous arrows and did not die. We began by saying that Mark noted in his gospel that it was for younger Gentile readers. Uh, he believed that these young students, I believe that there are young students that are listening to this message, and your heart is beating faster because you've heard truth, and you realize you need to make a decision. I invite you to stand before Jesus, to see him through the eyes of the centurion who said, truly, this was the Son of God. The centurion understood Jesus died for him. He wanted the same promise that Jesus gave to the thief who said, today, you will be with me in paradise. If you have understood that Jesus died for you and is willing to promise you a place in heaven, pray with me. 
Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me in my place on the cross for my sin and for promising me a place in heaven. Forgive me for my sins I've committed and make me your child. If you just received Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message, write to me, and we will send you more information about what it means to follow Jesus, and we'll send you a copy of Mark's gospel. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the message that we have heard today and for the life of Mark and how you used him to convey the message to the next generation. Help us to faithfully proclaim the message of Mark, the message of Jesus, to the next generation of people with whom we are living. May many come to Jesus as they hear these words. I pray in his name. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.